Good afternoon. My name is Ken Watson, and I'm a former city manager who's now the assistant director for training and research with the Arkansas Municipal League. And this is the session on the ADA. If you came to the, se if you thought you were at the session on sexual harassment, you're at the wrong place. We'd like for you to uh, come down to the front or move towards the front because in a few minutes we're going to have a uh, slideshow, and it's going to be very difficult for you to see if you're in the back of the room. Also, I have an announcement to make at the very first here. I've been asked to announce that the availability of a paper recently issued by ICMA's National Public Service Accreditation Board, uh, which is called the ADA Implication for Measurement, uh, is available. It was advertised in the newsletter, but some of you may have missed it. It's free of charge to all ICMA members. Uh, after reviewing sections of the new law uh, appropriate to measurement, the paper discusses the impact of the ADA on test and testing practices and employment issues. Again, this paper is provided to ICMA members on request at no charge uh, as a service of ICMA. You may uh, write to the National Public Service Accreditation Board at ICMA at 777 North Capitol Suite, Northeast Suite 500, Washington, D.C., 2002, or you may call uh, ICMA. Availability will also be noted again in the uh, upcoming newsletter. As I mentioned, I'm Ken Watson with the Arkansas Municipal League, and those of us with Arkansas on our name badges have been stopped rather frequently and asked certain questions during this conference. Uh, as you know, Arkansas is very much in the limelight these days. Uh, those of you uh, may have heard that the University of Arkansas has the unprecedented distinction of having the only athletic department in the country that has fired its head football coach after he lost the first football game of the season. And also, I suppose we have the distinction of being the home state of one of this year's presidential candidates. Uh, although Governor Clinton has been our governor for over 10 years, now that he's running for president, we're learning new things about him as uh, the whole country is. Um, as uh, President Bush oftentimes has difficulty deciding uh, where his hometown is or home state, whether it's Maine or Texas or Connecticut, those of us in Arkansas have uh, watched in amusement as Governor Clinton also seems to have problems deciding what his hometown is or where his hometown is. Prior to running for president, he was always from Hot Springs, and this was where he graduated from high school. And now that he's running for president, he's from Hope, Arkansas, where he, spent the, where he was born and spent the first five years of his life. Uh, he has us all guessing uh, as to where he's going to be from if he's elected president, you know, whether it'll be Little Rock or Georgetown or Oxford, England or, or wherever, we, we, we really don't know. But by the way, Hope and Hot Springs both are manager cities in Arkansas and have some very interesting uh, experiences as a result of Governor Clinton being nominated. Uh, Gus Pappas is the city manager of Hot Springs, and I believe he's here this afternoon, and uh, if you'll buy him a cup of coffee, he'll be glad to share some of these experiences with you. Well, what does this have to do with ADA? Uh, nothing that I know of, other than uh, I would mention that I've seen the crowd here, that uh, at last year's conference in Boston, there was a grand total of five people that showed up for the workshop on the ADA, and that was including the moderator and the speaker. So obviously you've heard about the today's speakers, and this is the reason that you're here. Our reputation precedes us, I suppose. Now, the format of today's workshop will be very informal, and I'm going to give a brief overview of the act and uh, some compliance suggestions, and then uh, Mr. Jim Boré will give a about a 15-minute slide presentation on the Hillsborough, Florida experience and what they're doing and what they've done to get into compliance with ADA. Then Mr. Carlos Suarez will conclude by speaking about complying with the communication provisions of the ADA. At the conclusion of our presentation, the three of us will be available to answer questions that you might have. Now, it's very, very difficult to talk about talk about the ADA in, in 60 minutes, or in this case, maybe 20 minutes or 15 minutes. Uh, I've been to seminars that have lasted literally two days and never covered all the aspects of the ADA. However, I was told to be very basic in my talk, 
and then be available to answer specific questions at the end, and this is what we intend to do. Okay, on July 26, 1990, at the largest signing ceremony in our nation's history, President Bush signed into the law the ADA. By, this, by signing this bill, the President responded to the call of an estimated 43 million Americans to pass the most sweeping civil rights legislation in decades. Now, the ADA is a clear man of their lives. In general, the ADA makes it cities to discriminate against individuals with disabilities. An employer must, evalu must evaluate the capabilities of each person individually rather than make assumptions about whether that person can or what that person can or cannot do. Now, the major goal of the law is to motivate American organizations to provide opportunities for service and employment for citizens and constituents who have historically been isolated, discriminated against, and otherwise precluded from full participation in the workforce and social activities of our cities. Well, what does this really mean for American cities that uh, are charged with the responsibility of upholding the public trust? Well, local governments may not discriminate against people with disabilities. It also means that all city facilities and services must be accessible to people with disabilities. And that these people will be given the same consideration that people that, uh, without disabilities are given. Now, who's responsible for enforcing the ADA? The Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, EEOC, enforces a the, ADA, the ADA. If a federal court finds that a city has violated the ADA, the penalties that must be imposed on the city include having to hire that person, reinstate or promote the person, provide back pay, provide reasonable accommodations to the individual, or pay compensatory or punitive damages up to $300,000 for intentional discrimination violations. Now, at the Arkansas Municipal League, uh, we recommended to our cities uh, several basic steps that we encourage them to take in order to get into compliance as quickly as possible with the ADA. And I'd like to share these with you this afternoon, and again, with the understanding that there are, there, there are many more aspects of the ADA than I'm going to mention, but this is going to be, I'm going to be painting with a very broad brush, and you may want to ask questions after uh, the conclusion. Okay, step number one, update your job discrimination application form and interview methods. The courts will consider job descriptions as evidence of the essential functions of that job. The days of drafting your job descriptions haphazardly are over. Job descriptions should precisely, and I emphasize that word precisely, and accurately describe the essential functions of each job that the, each city employee performs. The ADA clearly states that you may not discriminate against a person with a disability in hiring if the person is otherwise qualified to do that job. And if your job description does not accurately reflect the essential functions of the job, then you're going to have a great deal of difficulty convincing an administrative law judge that you didn't hire a disabled person because they couldn't perform a task because you neglected to include that in your job description. Job application forms should not ask for information that may be discriminating. Your job application should only ask questions that are job related. The ADA prohibits pre-employment inquiries about disabilities or medical history on the job application or during the job interview. Now, prior to conducting a job interview, you need to know what questions you're going to ask in advance. Remember that the interviewer may ask about one's ability to perform the task or the job, uh, but you can't inquire about disabilities or conduct tests that tend to screen out people with disabilities. Now, examples of some questions that you must avoid that are very, very commonly, up until uh, a year ago anyway, were on job application forms for job interviewers follows. Again, these are things that you uh, must avoid asking on your job application or job interview. Number one, have you ever been treated for any of the following conditions or diseases? Many of you may have had on your applications that question and enlisted uh, a whole bunch of uh, diseases or informa medical information. Have you ever been treated for a mental condition? Again, you cannot ask that. 
Have you ever been treated for drug addiction or alcoholism? That's a no-no. Have you ever filed for workers' compensation insurance? Again, you may not ask that question. Now, we recommend that each city identify those persons who are going to be involved uh, in the selection process for the initial employment and train those individuals to become, to become very familiar with the, the employment provision, provisions of the ADA because it's anticipated that most litigation in these early years of the ADA will be the result of loose comments, inappropriate inquiries of supervisors and department heads who obviously uh, are not familiar with the law. So having trained and knowledgeable personnel clerks or personnel managers and department heads will be one way of demonstrating that your city has made a good faith effort to comply with the ADA. All right, step two, separate medical records from personnel records. Cities should collect and maintain all medical information obtained from medical exams and inquiries on separate forms in separate medical files and must treat it as a confidential medical record. The information should not be in the employee's personnel file and steps should be taken to guarantee the security of the medical information. And also very important, remember traditional pre-employment medical examinations are prohibited under the ADA. Examinations, medical examinations, may be administered after, after an offer of employment is made, provided that all employees are required to take the medical examination. Step three, designate an ADA coordinator. Now, cities should name a responsible employee to coordinate its ADA compliance efforts and investigate complaints. The ADA coordinator is to coordinate your city's efforts to comply with and carry out your responsibility under the law. You must make available to all interested individuals the name, the office address, and the phone number of your ADA coordinator. And then this leads on into uh, step four, post public notices. All cities, regardless of size, must make available and distribute information regarding the city's compliance efforts. Equal employment opportunity notices should be posted in conspicuous places and provided to employment agencies that, is, that assist the sight impaired and other disabled individuals. Cities must be sensitive to the limitations of those individuals with sensory impairments when providing public notice. Remember to publish your non-discrimination on the basis of disability claims or clause on all your employment related documents, all program applications, and all policy statements. Step five, prepare a self-evaluation plan. It is recommended that every city appoint a self-evaluation committee to immediately begin to work with your ADA coordinator to prepare a self-evaluation plan. Now, the law states that all cities are required to, to conduct a self-evaluation plan by January 26 of 93. So you have a few months to get your self-evaluation plan done. Now, your self-evaluation plan should evaluate all your city's programs and services in light of the idea of equal employment and e equal opportunity and equal access. Do people with disabilities in your community have the same opportunity to enjoy the same services or participate in the programs that your city offers as other people? Remember, a city that conducts a critical self-evaluation of its programs and practices will stand a better chance of compliance and cost avoidance than those cities that do not conduct a critical self-evaluation plan. Now, law says that after completion of your self-evaluation plan, it must be put out for public comment, then filed and retained for one year for those cities that have 50 or more employees, and three years for those that with fewer than 50 employees. Step six, uh, prepare a transition plan. We recommend that the uh, city officials appoint a committee to work with your ADA coordinator to prepare a transition plan. Now, a committee composed of a few individuals within uh, the disability community will be beneficial in helping you prepare your transition plan. The transition plan is a must, is a must for cities with more than 50 employees. Your transition plan should identify all structural changes needed for, uh, to your public facilities, including your city hall, your public playgrounds, 
your swimming pool, your library, your walkways, your public restrooms, and so forth. The transition plan must set forth the steps necessary to complete such changes and a time frame for doing so. At a minimum, the plan must identify the physical obstacles that limit accessibility to all city-owned or leased building or facilities. You must describe in detail the method that will, be, that will make the facilities available. You must schedule in detail when you plan to make your public facilities accessible. And the time, if the time period is longer than a year to accomplish these tasks, you must identify all steps that will be undertaken during each year of the transition plan. Your transition plan should indicate the official responsible for implementing the plan, which will probably be your ADA coordinator. And like your self-evaluation plan, your transition plan must be publicized for public comment and be finalized no later than July 26, 1992. Two months ago, this was supposed to have been done. Step seven, adopt a formal grievance complaint procedure. We recommend that all cities adopt and publish a grievance procedure. This is a must, again, for cities with 50 or more employees. Your grievance procedure must provide prompt and, and equitable methods for the resolution of any complaint that alleges a violation of the ADA. Your city's grievance procedure must be formally adopted by your city council or city board and published. And this should be done, again, as soon as possible, preferably, you've, hopefully you've already done it, you did it last January. Step eight, purchase TDDs for emergency services. Cities shall, make, shall take the appropriate steps to ensure that communications with disabled applicants and members of the public are as effective as communications with others. Cities must equip, must, must equip emergency systems with the necessary technology to promptly receive and respond to a call from users of telecommunication devices for the deaf or the TDDSs. Uh, the Department of Justice encourages cities to have TDSs where the provision of telephone service is a major function of that department, such as your city hall, your city utility office, the public library, and so forth. Step nine, adopt a compliance rev uh, resolution. Again, we recommend that after you've designated your ADA coordinator and posted your required public notices, started preparation of your uh, self-evaluation plan and your transition plans, that you pa pass a compliance resolution. Your compliance resolution should state that you've reviewed all city employment practices, you've appointed your ADA coordinator, and you've conducted your transition plan and, your, and the process of, of conducting your uh, self-evaluation plan, and you've established a grievance procedure. This should be all part of your compliance resolution. Then uh, we recommend that your city council pass this resolution, publish it, and retain it with all other required ADA documents. All right, step 10 and the last one is document your efforts. Always, always, always document your efforts to comply with your ADA requirements. By documenting, your, you attempt to demonstrate your good, for, good faith efforts to comply with the law and your concern for the disabled within your community. And in the event of legal action, a good paper trail could mean the difference between winning and losing a lawsuit. Those are the basic 10 steps that we have... Uh, given to the members of the Arkansas uh, cities in the Arkansas municipal, that belong to the Arkansas Municipal League. And I really hope that you have heard all this before. I hope that this is old hat to you. Uh, I hope that you've initiated the actions that I've suggested and, and you've been bored by what I've said. Uh, if not, I highly recommend that you do so immediately because some of the deadlines have already passed and it's, it's imperative that you, that you comply with these deadlines. Remember, the act went into effect for the public sector on July 26th of this year, 1992. So if you haven't taken these steps, then I hope that your city attorney, city attorney is very skilled in defending lawsuits. And uh, as we mentioned earlier, uh, I'll be available at the uh, end of the presenta panel presentation to ask, answer questions. Now we're going to hear from Jim Borey, who will tell us about the compliance steps that they've taken in Hillsborough County, Florida. Jim. Good afternoon. I am Jim Borey, and uh, I'm Senior Assistant County Administrator in Hillsborough County. Uh, I have responsibility for several county departments, 
that are in the process of implementing many of the things which Ken described to you. Uh, I'm not Frank Toronto, as the program indicated. And then again, our Director of Communications is not Frank Toronto either. He is Frank Toronto, an Italian who uh, does not have an American surname. He is back home in Tampa implementing many of what we're t the things that we're talking about today. ICMA really wanted to have, I'm here because ICMA really wanted to have a broader perspective on the things which Hillsborough County is doing. We don't profess to be out in front of everyone on the issue. In fact, instead of being bored as Ken went through his litany, I think maybe being frightened is more like it. And many of you may be in the same boat as we are. Many of you may want to move down closer because with this room, it's going to be difficult potentially to see the slides. Please feel free to do so during the course of the presentation. I'm pleased to be here to talk about Hillsborough County's response. I'm going to focus in on what we're doing for ADA requirements, not necessarily what the regulations themselves are. I think Ed, excuse me, Ken has given you an excellent outline of that. I will deal with all four titles of the ADA Act and discuss our response for employment, public services, public accommodations, and telecommunications. I provide, I will provide a handout at the end uh, with background material after this session for those that are interested. I've got a limited number of copies, but if you give me a business card, I'd, I promise to send everyone a copy. Our general approach involves many different facets, a lot of which Ken has talked about. We set up three countywide task forces. There are task forces that deal with employment, public services, and public accommodations. Each of these task forces include members of all affected departments. Each are led by a department director. We felt it was incredibly important to have high-level involvement on the part of county staff members. We've arranged for briefing of all management personnel and in Hillsborough County, that represents about 250 people. We've scheduled public hearings as required. Our public hearings will be in October and November. In addition, we provided posters that are placed in prominent locations throughout Hillsborough County, and these help show our commitment to implementing ADA. Let's first focus on Title I that deals with employment. We've developed guidelines for supervisors to assist them in the entire employment process. These guidelines include actions to take prior to the interview, during the interview, and after the interview. Prior to the interview, it is absolutely essential that key essential job functions be defined. Guidelines for the interview process are also clearly outlined by our material, and some of that is available for you after. Each interviewer asks an interviewee if he or she can accomplish the essential functions. If they cannot accomplish them, they then ask under what certain accommodations they could perform the essential functions. If the accommodations can be reasonably met, then we are obligated, obligated to provide the accommodation. And that factor cannot be used in the selection process. The requirements for public services relate directly to what is being accomplished by the Hillsborough Area Rapid Transit Agency, or HART. HART is proceeding along many lines to address the requirements. In 1993, 40 existing large buses in the HART fleet will be modified with wheelchair lifts, bringing the fleet accessibility up to 85%. This will cost them approximately $1 million in this current fiscal e coming fiscal year. Also, Hart will purchase low floor minivans with handicap accessible ramps for emergency assistance to stranded patrons. These minivans purchased in the next year will cost approximately $90,000. In addition, Hart bus drivers have begun to call out street names on bus routes to aid the visually impaired. A paratransit service is also being developed to aid those individuals unable to use the fixed route bus system. This is a door-to-door -door service 
operated during the same days and hours as the fixed route service. It has comparable fares and response times, and there's no limit on the purpose for those trips. This system is being phased in and will be fully operational in 1997. By 1996, we estimate that there will be an excess of 13,000 eligible clients, which will take over 100,000 trips annually on the system. Hart and Hillsborough County have signed a contract for the county to provide this service for Hart. Hart will be funding the trips and buying the equipment. This will cost approximately 600,000 in the next fiscal year. In addition, Hart will purchase replacement vans for a county share van program. This is another $450,000. The paratransit plan was developed through an ADA committee that has been formed uh, quite for some time and was the subject of public hearings. Hillsborough County and Hart are working together on a joint implementation of a sidewalk handicap ramp accessibility program needed for bus stops. It's anticipated that we'll jointly spend this year 200000 on that program. And also, in the next fiscal year, Hart will begin installing approximately 150 shelters countywide. These shelters were designed to meet the ADA accessibility standards. The, a transit terminal of Hart also is being modified to meet handicap accessibility for restroom and, and ticket accessibility. And finally, Hart is in the process of phasing in a second hearing impaired telephone system line. The requirements for public accommodations include both public and commercial facilities. We believe buildings constructed in Hillsborough County will meet ADA requirements since our building code has provisions which appear to meet all the ADA standards. Revisions were made with the last building code updates which we think will ensure compliance. The requirements for public facilities, as you know, affect our, that is the county building and parking areas. We have undertaken a survey of all county facilities which are both owned and leased. A checklist for those items which we have considered is included as part of the handout material. We've included such major areas as handicapped parking, signage, door clearances, entrances to buildings, corridors, elevators, restrooms, drinking fountains, and the like. We are currently finalizing a transition plan to do modifications where necessary and feasible. The solutions to these problems include retrofitting with ramping, modifications to restrooms, signage changes, and, and the like. Again, the standard is for retrofitting uh, and the criteria is maximum extent feasible. If it is just absolutely economically impossible to accomplish some of the modifications, then there doesn't, they don't absolutely need to take place. It's interpreted based on the resources that the community has that they can put to bear on the problem. In examining public facilities, we're also evaluating requirements within the public right-of-way. This affects all sidewalk areas throughout the county. We're in the process of surveying all these facilities and we'll be developing a phase plan for retrofitting all areas with curb cuts and ramps as appropriate. This survey is taking us approximately 29 weeks. We have on the order of 40,000 40, potential locations for ramps throughout the unincorporated area of Hillsborough County, which is, if you're familiar with Hillsborough County, is, is quite large. We don't interpret that we're going to have to retrofit every one of these locations, but rather retrofit those where they're feasible and necessary. We will do this with in-house forces and utilize our gas tax funding available through local option to accomplish it. We're developing a prioritization program in which the more urbanized areas will be dealt with first. This is a major consideration in our county where there's a wide variety of intensity of development. Some areas definitely will need to be retrofitted with curbs where other areas will have very little need. 
we have made, I think, significant progress in dealing with the telecommunications concerns of the ADA requirements. We have instituted a six-month pilot project for the open captioning of Board of County Commissioners meetings. The opening caption project was re begun in response to a plea from the hearing impaired community. It was not necessarily in response to the ADA requirements, although we feel that it will be effective in meeting those standards. Carlos Suarez, our last speaker, will go into more detail about the opening captioning program that we have worked with his company on. However, I want to just summarize our current procedure. We provide for real-time open captioning. That is that we display almost immediately on the screen what a speaker is saying during the course of a live meeting. This is being accomplished through court reporters taking down everything that is said. This is then immediately converted to words that are displayed on the screen. This is accomplished through computer hardware and software that again will be described in a moment. The cost of this six-month pilot project is put at somewhere over $60,000, approximately half of that being capital, upfront capital and uh, software costs. Uh, we have, I believe, been uh, able to very effectively and cost-effectively provide this service for all board meetings because of the in-house open captioning staff that we've utilized, uh, the court reporters and cost-effective equipment that we've utilized. We have selected open captioning rather than closed captioning to ensure that we have accessibility throughout the entire hearing impaired community, even those that don't have devices to, to be able to utilize the closed captions. In addition to our open captioning system, we recently used the telecommunications system to provide an interesting accommodation for one of our members of the Board of County Commissioners, and I thought, since I think this is a somewhat of a bellwether of potentially things to come, but that uh, you might be interested. One of our board members has recently been out of office and out of the office and unavailable for board meetings due to treatment for cancer. She had a similar type of treatment that Paul Songus did, and this requires her to remain isolated while her immune system recovers from this treatment. I'm sorry that this slide is rather dark and in this large room may be difficult to see. We've accommodated her participation in board meetings via teleconferencing setup. A monitor was installed at her normal station along the dais in the boardroom. Her picture and voice communication comes through this monitor. In her house, she has a monitor to watch the cable broadcast of board meetings. When she is speaking, her picture appears to the audience, which receives our broadcast. She votes the same time other board members do through the use of a TDD device, a telephone device for the hearing impaired. Through the use of this device and our normal voting machines, all votes are recorded and announced at the same time. We sought and received a state attorney general's opinion that this procedure met the requirements of Florida's very, very stringent sunshine law. We believe this setup has significant implications for future teleconferencing arrangements in local government. This was just a brief overview of some of the things that Hillsborough County is doing to comply with the ADA Act requirements, those that were outlined by Ken earlier. And instead of ending with the uh, typical sunset, I thought you'd like to see a Florida wetland. This certainly is a stark contrast to the Nevada landscape that we have been experiencing over the last few days. Um, 
you got a, a little bit of an introduction here. Uh, my name is Carlos Suarez, and I'm with Cheetah Systems. We're a manufacturer of equipment for doing uh, open and closed captioning, and uh, this is becoming a, <clears throat> a very important piece of equipment now for a lot of you who want to uh, provide uh, access to your city and county board meetings or, or local school, bo school board meetings. I'm going to try to keep this short because we're, uh, we're running late. Uh, we can see here the Americans with Disabilities Act has two titles that are specifically called out that are the most important ones to consider when you're considering telecommunications. Title II uh, involves providing uh, public access, uh, and it talks about auxiliary aids and, and the types of auxiliary aids that meet the requirements. Uh, Title IV is the telecommunications portion, and it also talks about providing uh, access through public service announcements, captioning public service announcements. Uh, go ahead. Uh, I'm going to flip through these fairly quickly. There are some booklets that we have available that, that provide all this information as well. Um, as far as uh, specific legislation beyond the ADA, the Department of Justice has issued uh, specific regulations around compliance uh, in the department regulations, uh, it talks about what is considered an appropriate auxiliary aid. Uh, those auxiliary aids are considered up here, and you can see uh, closed and open caption decoders, open and caption uh, captioning, video text displays, etc. Um, also, the National Center for Deafness has uh, issued a similar interpretation. It's important that uh, you be aware of the different interpretations. Today, it's not clear as to what is a full uh, requirement of the ADA and what is considered complying with, with this requirement for your public access. Uh, another act, go ahead, is called the TV Decoder Circuitry Act, and that will go into effect in July of 1993. In fact, all these acts uh, totally come into effect in July of, of 1993. And the Decoder Circuitry Act specifically re requires that every television set in America provide a decoder circuitry within it. And I don't know if you've seen decoders, but decoders are what provide the captioning up on the display. And uh, a lot of uh, people today, there's only about a half a million of those boxes out there. But in the future, every television set will have it. So within the first year, you'll be looking at something like 30 million decoders out there. So it'll become uh, very important, the effects of this act. and. Uh, it's important that you're aware of it. The alternatives, okay. go ahead. The alternatives for providing access uh, today are signing and captioning. And uh, signing, I would not consider a very good alternative. It, in in some cases, it will uh, check the box, but it will not provide the solution that you need. If you look at the some 24 million. Uh, hearing impaired people out there today, which is 10% of the population, um, only about a half a million of those people are actually uh, people who were deaf at birth. And those are the people that actually know sign language. Uh, the majority of the people are latent deaf, and the latent deaf, of course, would not know sign language. So you wouldn't be reaching a very large part of the audience if you provide signing. Go ahead. As far as people that need captioning today, uh, the largest groups are the 24 million Americans who are hearing impaired, but also uh, there's some 38% of Americans uh, that uh, have some kind of hearing loss. There are the uh, English for the second language group, which is very large also. That's over 11% of the population. So you're, you're addressing the largest, uh, well, the largest handicap group from, from a standpoint of the ADA by providing the service. And also, you're addressing with people English as a second language over 20% of the population. Um, other people that will benefit from this will be uh, children trying to learn to, to read. And um, in meetings like this, in some cases, a lot of people have trouble hearing in the back of the room. So uh, that will be a secondary benefit. Go ahead. As far as the people who are captioning today, uh, you have uh, television stations are providing captioning, state and local governments, uh, meetings, churches are starting to provide captioning, 
and uh, and then other production facilities. So it's going to be a, a fairly sweeping uh, changes. The types of captioning that are available are uh, closed and open captioning. The differences are that in closed captioning, it's written into what's called a vertical blanking interval. So unless you have a decoder, you can't see it, and that's what goes into uh, into the NTSC signals that are broadcast today. Uh, open captioning just provides the text at the bottom of the screen. Uh, and within captioning, there are two types. There's real-time captioning and offline captioning. Real-time captioning is essentially uh, what you saw in Hillsborough County's presentation, where you have a, a steno captioner who is um, capturing everything that's going on in real time. And those are the only people that can do that. They're usually trained for the court systems and they can uh, capture information at over 200 words a minute. And then there's offline captioning. Uh, and we, we have systems that provide for both of those where you can do it offline if you're not uh, telev televising live. Finally, the equipment that you would require for doing this will, uh, is essentially the steno machine, a computer with our, our software, an encoder, <laughs> decoder, and a, a couple of monitors, um, and you can go ahead and flip that one. And the costs generally run somewhere around uh, $15,000. So your biggest expense isn't in the equipment. Your largest expense is in actual uh, personnel having the, uh, the steno people available to provide the, the captioning. Um, so I'm going to end it with that. Um, you may want to ask some questions. If, if I don't know if you've looked into this, but uh, um, Jim has gone very, very far down the path on, on providing the service, and it, um, you may consider their efforts for, for Hillsborough County. Uh, thank you. We have time for maybe three or four questions, is that right? And uh, then there's another group that will be in here after this one. So we'll take questions. You might have to wave your hand before we can see you. We're glaring into the lights here. There's a question down front. The, the question was the percent of cost for operation and maintenance. For the six-month pilot program, a little bit more than 50 percent is really the operations and maintenance costs. Over the long term, that's going to be virtually 100 percent. So we're looking at, with what Carlos had indicated, 15,000 plus the additional equipment that we purchased, we're, we're looking at close to 30,000 for the capital, for the upfront costs, and then for the six-month pilot program, about 30,000 for personnel. And that will be an ongoing cost, and that uh, is, that's just a six months, so you analyze, annualize that, and it will be, it'll be twice that. Um, the question that I had, I'm from a county in Washington, and I'm wondering from a structural, organizational base, who does your ADA coordinator report to, and what size of staff do you have in Hillsborough County? We don't have a an individual staff that's set aside specifically for ADA. We've had utilized people throughout county government. The basic coordinator for ADA is the Director of Human Resources. He reports to an assistant county administrator who reports to the county administrator. But we also have three task forces that are head, uh, headed up each by a department director. They end up, see, uh, two of them report to one assistant county administrator and another one reports to another assistant county administrator. But we have a large number of people throughout Hillsborough County, they're involved in ADA in a very major way. So while there's not a sp particular earmark staff, we have a, lar we have a significant level of involvement in employees. So I, can't, I couldn't give an exact number. That would it really be dozens at a minimum that would be involved in it. Sure. As far as your director of human resources, would that be as far as compliance with the act? Would that be who you would call your ADA coordinator? Yes. A, okay. Thank yes. you. Yes. And he also has primary responsibilities for the employment side of the, the title for employment. I have a question. I have a question on the timing of uh, the transition plan and needs assessment that maybe you would care to comment on. Um, our 
city staff has taken the position that you need to do a needs assessment to determine where you're deficient before you can prepare a transition plan uh, to rectify those deficiencies and the timing of the law is such that the transition plan comes before the needs assessment. Uh, would any of you care to comment on that? This is the federal government in their infinite wisdom. Uh, exactly your observation is absolutely correct. You would think that you would want to take, you'd want to do your self-evaluation plan before you did your specific transition plan in which you identify the, uh, the structures and so forth, but that's not the way that the law reads in terms of the compliance date. But uh, logically, the way that you described it is the way it should be. What have, well, follow up on that, what have, have, uh, has uh, Hillsborough County done in terms of, uh, of that inconsistency and what does that mean for the future if a transitions plan is prepared in advance of the needs assessment? The question I, I think, I hope everybody heard, is what, what does it mean for the future if the transition plan is a, uh, completed before the needs assessment is done? I think that means that we're going to be continually changing our transition plan. Over the life of the act, which is going to be forever as far as we're concerned, we're going to continue to update all parts of our transition plan over the course of time and things will change. We'll have a different ability to be able to implement some of the acts. We may transition from one building to another. We are going to have a long-term program for the sidewalk ramping of potentially 40,000 ramps in Hillsborough County. So this is a, we're in it for the long haul. We have a, an obligation to do everything that we reasonably can expect it to be, do, to be done over the near term. But this is certainly a long-term operation, and we'll be changing our transition plan many, many times. I've been to several uh, seminars like this or workshops like this, like, like most people in the room, and I've heard different things on pre-hire psychological exams for, for police officers. Can you have any comment on whether you think those uh, are still permissible under the ADA? It depends on whose attorney that you've uh, visited with. Uh, I suspect that you could make a strong case for psychological exam being an essential function of a police officer. And uh, I think most uh, cities that I'm aware of are, are, are taking that approach. Obviously, some parts of the ADA are, uh, litigation is going to be the ultimate out outcome, and, and this, that will decide um, that area. That is a very, very delicate uh, area, uh, and I don't know of any concrete answer uh, except uh, follow the advice of your attorney and, and all the experts that you can. How's that for an answer as clear as mud? I would, I would add to that that our county attorney's office over a year ago said that we should not have any psychological testing at all. Uh, we have a cons relatively conservative county attorney's office, but they took that position. I'm with the city of South Lake Tahoe, right up the hill here, and um, I have a very specific question in regards to the grievance process. We have set one up. We've designated the ADA coordinator. There has been some misinformation, I think, in the community um, as to who could access this grievance process. Is it purely an internal grievance process for city employees or as a city entity um, is this grievance process opened up to the entire community? Yes, your grievance procedure is not to be confused with your employee grievance procedure. Your employees uh, have a problem with the way that uh, uh, their supervisor has told them to do this and such, and so they have, there's a grievance. Maybe your city has a grievance procedure for that. Your grievance procedure that's set up under the ADA is strictly for a situation that might occur when, uh, as a mother of a child, you wanted access to the city swimming pool, but uh, your child is in a wheelchair and you can't have access there. So now, through the grievance procedure, you would take it up with the ADA coordinator, and there would be specific steps that you would follow in order to get your grievance heard and hopefully remedied in order to get your child uh, access to the city swimming pool. Okay, one follow-up question then. How about an employee of Safeway or the utility district or any other quasi-governmental entity that wants to go to the ADA advisory committee that the city has set up and they have a specific complaint about 
the ADA compliance of Safeway or any other private employer, and they want to take that up with the city. Okay, it, my interpretation and understanding would be that would not be uh, the function of the city's ADA uh, grievance procedure, that you're strictly talking about the public services uh, that the city uh, pro provides. Now, there, ba there may be another committee that is appointed or, or something that would deal with that, but not your one that is specifically required under the ADA law. Thank you. Taking a great weight off my shoulder. There's, there's only one exception to that, and I, this probably doesn't apply, and that is if your county or city does have an ordinance that addresses this separately from that, there could be a county or public agency response that's necessary, but unless that's a special layer to the, that's been added to a, the, the national ADA, it wouldn't apply. I believe yeah. we have time for one question. Well, it's my understanding that you have to have a procedure for determining uh, what's a reasonable accommodation, if you can afford it or not. Well, what's that, what is a reasonable accommodation? How do you determine that, if you can afford it? Well, I'll, I'll let Ken finish up, but simply say that I don't know that anybody has a, an excellent answer to that question. You have to look at what the resources of the government or entity is and what the resources they have put to, put to bear. I think a lot of that, unfortunately, will be solved through the court system rather than very specifically stated in law and the rules that implement that, but maybe Ken has some additional wisdom. Again, this is going to be an area that uh, will probably uh, require some litigation to determine it. I think the ADA would deliberately, though, did not want to say that a reasonable accommodation was anything less than $50,000 or $100,000 or whatever. It uh, does uh, talk about a reasonable accommodations in regard to your total overall budget. And what we advise the, uh, uh, many of the cities in Arkansas is, uh, is the, uh, how, how, I'm trying to think of a polite way to say, it, is how would this play before a jury? In other words, uh, you have a request to uh, put a uh, wheelchair ramp in the public swimming pool I just mentioned earlier. And you say, I'm sorry, we're not going to do that. You tell the disabled community, I'm sorry, we're not going to do that. That costs $10,000. And your city budget is $5 million. Now, if you go to court and there's a jury up here, how will that play? You know, I, I think the answer is, $10,000 in a $5 million budget, and you're, you're defending this uh, in a jury trial, uh, I think the answer is pretty obvious. But again, that's not answering your question specifically, and I apologize, I can't do that. That's about as good as an answer as I've received, so that's pretty good. Thank you. <laughs> okay, that uh, concludes the part, uh, our program today. I would like to just uh, remind you, when you're dealing with the ADA, that there are different compliance dates that affect the public sector uh, and the private sector. Uh, and so don't get confused with those. And if you're dealing with a consultant, make sure that consultant uh, is very keenly aware of the differences between the public sector and the private sector. And the main difference is for the public sector, most of the compliance dates have already passed. I mean, you are supposed to be in compliance on January 26, 1992, whereas the public sector has various, uh, excuse me, the private sector has various, has different compliance dates, plus they have the employee factor. If you have less than or more than so many employees, different things kick in. The public sector is not that way. And if I could leave you with a closing thought when, it, when, you, when you're thinking about ADA and you're asking yourself all these questions, remember that ADA concerns itself with, with two important things, equal opportunity and equal access. That's what the ADA is all about. So when you ask yourself, well, should I do this? Should I do that? Do I have to do this? Uh, what, what's my obligations, just ask yourself, you know, equal opportunity and equal access, and that's what it's all about. We do have some handouts down front, uh, Jim does, so uh, if you all want to come down here, feel free to. Thank you very much.